Hi, I'm Tim. Welcome to Watchbox and thanks for logging on. Well, I promised you better decor. This is our all new studio. Lighting's still coming along. There's some color balancing to be done, but as you can see, a solid upgrade from what we had. Tonight, of course, we are making a casting call, our first ever. We're talking about watches we love to hate and why we shouldn't. And we're trying to spot tomorrow's blue chip classics by examining the most enduring watch designs of today. All of that plus watch collector wrist chats tonight on Watches Tonight. I want to remind you that when the time comes to buy, trade, or sell watches, the folks who pay for these pixels downstairs in this very building thewatchbox.com. Over 2,500 pre-owned and vintage watches live right now, many with my own videos. Particularly when you're looking to sell, we pay cash, we pay fast, we make the process a no-brainer. And if you're looking to buy, well, I have something for that too. Team also at thewatchbox.com, the purchase and pricing inquiry line from you to me and my hand-picked crew for your questions about any watch you see on my Instagram or website or Watchbox Reviews, our flagship YouTube program. Of course, sometimes I want to see your views and reviews, and that starts with wrist shots. Wrist shots from the field, starting with Abdul R. of Germany, kicking back in the Black Forest and waking up with the Seiko Alpinist. Nicely framed, good light. We got Dylan L., aviator and watch enthusiast, showcasing his Grand Seiko Snowflake, very nicely composed, also good light. Nice little vignette background. Santos O. shares his Omega Seamaster Diver 300 meter with chrome dial and blue bezel. I particularly like that deep blue background and the deep blue bezel in sync, well coordinated. Elton H. of Dublin is back on the block with a Seiko SBDC 051 Vintage Diver Tribute. A quick jump into the box, see who's joining me. Eddie Landsberg first, usually first. Omegatron, hey Tim, are you planning on going to Watch Time LA in May? Bank on it, I'll see you there. We've got DX Mag E, hey there, hey DX, PY7. Whoa, new office, new studio, it's a fact. We got Hale Bop, we got Heather R, we got the 95th Phantom, and then He's noting, I used to be Slayer Rock forever. Don't worry, I still love you. We got BNS, Richard Combs from South Florida. We've got Tanis D, Blake Starr, Alexi Samola of Finland, Richard Hobbs, Thomas Burnett, Watch Doctor, Mez 944, Amin Reviews, James B, Don Rogan, and Mr. No Date, Adrian, welcome. Peter R, welcome from Yorkshire, and Joseph Tyson asking, where's the spread? You're talking about the watches? You might be confusing this with one of my watches inventory shows. This is not that. Those are on the other channel. All right, and finally, Kevin S. joined in from my old neck of the woods, New York City, jumping into a casting call. You've seen the watch reviews. You've seen the wrist shots. How do we bring them together while keeping the audience engaged? Well, the next step for this channel is to bring you in. Do you want to sit where Philippe Dufour is sitting? Well, you can. Now I'm starting a collector conversation series in which I want you to come in, show me your watches, talk to me about your past as a collector, and discuss your future collecting plans. This is a showcase for the people who watch. I finally have the opportunity to bring you here onto these sets, into this building, and to share your views and reviews of the watches that have made a difference in your life. From your first flame to your ultimate grail watch, I wanna hear from folks who are in roughly our northeastern corridor. We're starting local. We will be facilitating travel later on as the project grows. But if you're from New York City to Washington, D.C., email mondaymailbag at thewatchbox.com. Give me an idea of some of the watches you collect and let me know why you'd like to come on and feature in a collector conversation right here on Watchbox Studios. This is where I want to make collectors and viewers the stars. I don't want to hear from rock stars. I don't want to hear from pro ballers, and I don't want to give the time of day to influencers. No, I want you. I want your Seikos. I want your Timex Iron Man. I want your Patek Philippe, your Chopard, your Jager LeCoultre, Rolex, Omega, and Breitling. And I want it right here. Monday Mailbag at thewatchbox.com. Let's start this journey, because it is going to be a wild ride. Jumping into the box right here, we got Blake Starr, we got John Hepburn, we got Xavier N, we got Dave Opencar, and then right here, here, Abdul saying, great idea, we'll be waiting when you are in Switzerland. Abdul, when we get the chance to start this series up in Europe, you will be my first call. Now, this evening, 
Watches we love to hate and why we should not. Let's be honest, there are some watches in the industry, in the watch space, that tend to draw more self-satisfied ire than most. And I have inserted my dagger into the beast so I can claim no innocence. Herewith, the watches that I think we love to hate a little too much and why we shouldn't, starting with the Hublot Big Bang. It had to start with the Hublot Big Bang. Back in 2005, the Hublot Big Bang bowed at Basel World as a very, very thinly veiled, lower priced ripoff of the Royal Oak Offshore. Everyone knew it, but here's the thing. Hublot was in on the joke from the beginning. The Hublot Big Bang was like a party drug. You were gonna have a great time, but you know for a fact it is not FDA approved. Since then, I have to say the Big Bang has grown up. It's not a discreet watch, a fine watch. It's not haute de gamme or haute horlogerie. It is not handmade in almost every case. What it is, is honest. It is a big, loud, boisterous piece for people who are looking for exactly that. In a world where there's a space for Lamborghini as well as 32 Ford hot rods, there's a place for Hublot. Is it a little bit nonsensical? Yes, but then again, you and I have already convinced ourselves to buy $50,000 man jewelry without batting an eye. And in that context, there is nothing ridiculous about that. By the way, the Mecca 10 Blue Ceramic is a very neat watch and mechanically accomplished. And if you ever liked Erector Sets or Meccano, you cannot help but love that movement. Now, Speaking of watches we love to hate, this one has arrived relatively recently on the scene. Only about a year old, the Rolex Sea Dweller Two-Tone has drawn a great deal of ire, and I'm trying to place it. And here's why. People at Rolex authentically thought this would be cool, and there was probably no marketing case to be made for it. And for acting on Basically, impulse, I have to give Rolex a lot of credit. I didn't think they had it in them. Think about it. This isn't a deep sea 2008 kind of watch. Back then, Rolex was obviously copying the look that was popular back in 2008. In the mid to late 2000s, bigger was better and biggest was best. The deep sea killed off the 40 millimeter sea dweller to the unending ire of the Rolex purists. And it was unwearably huge. Sometimes even on large wrists, the darn thing was just too thick. That was a voguish watch. This is not. Why? Because in the year 2019, 2020, there isn't a hue and cry for 43 millimeter oversized diving bells for your wrist. And there certainly isn't a cry for 80s and 90s style two-tone yellow, gold, and steel. And yet Rolex did both. Two-tone yellow, gold, and steel in a 43 millimeter fat old case. This is a watch that Rolex designers honestly thought was gonna be really neat. The ultimate niche watch in our era. And if there is one word we never associate with Rolex, it is niche. That is why this thing, a labor of love, deserves at least our grudging admiration for the courage of the people at Rolex who created it and for the simple fact that that spirit exists at Rolex in any respect. Jumping into the box, I've got a question from Tcon. What is the best gold 18 karat watch under 20,000? You can still buy a whole load of Longa Saxonia models for under $20,000 used. I would get myself a caliber 921 Longomatic and call it a day. Really, that is the best bet. And then right here, we've got Booser saying, Rolex should have gone full gold with that Sea Dweller 43. That would have been, well, bold and gold. And then we've got Panacea, as you saying, well, asking, is anyone else from Monaco? Do we have anyone else from the Principality of Monaco in the box tonight? And then we got Brian Francis saying, yes, Sea Dweller, full gold, green bezel. Rolex, you heard it here first. Be bold, be gold. And then right here we've got Jesus841 asking, Tim, what are your thoughts on gold sports watches? I have to say, honestly, the anniversary dial that is the green lacquer dial, Rolex GMT Master II in full yellow gold, is a really, really cool looking watch. As for subs, I think the yellow gold Smurf is an underrated sub, and one of the rarest subs. I'd say I see 
five white gold smurfs for every one in yellow gold. They exist, you can find them. As far as other models, let's recall that possibly the coolest ever Royal Oak 15202 Royal Oak Jumbo was the Hourglass limited edition from about four years ago. They made 50 pieces with a green petite tapisserie dial in a yellow gold case. And if you can't find that, the yellow gold AP Royal Oaks as a group are pretty cool pieces, especially the jumbo that's double gold dial and case and bracelet. So I have strong feelings on that side. Uh, also remember the very first Speedmaster limited edition, the Moonwatch Pro full yellow gold, the BA14522. That is a very credible yellow gold sports watch and a certified blue chip collectible if you find one in good condition, especially if you find the one that belonged to Richard Nixon, briefly, albeit refused as a gift. Now jumping back into the box, a watch we love to hate, perhaps too much, the AP Code 1159. I admit this is an instance where I have thrown my obloquy onto the heap, and I must say I have somewhat defamed this line of watch. It does not translate in pictures, but I will also say that it was too, it was too subtle for both of us, and it's largely already fixed. Sean, I don't know, are you able to go full screen right there with the new equipment? Yeah, there we go. That is the Bolshoi Theater edition. I have to say, this is an example of what AP is already doing to transition to the Mark II Code 1159. They are going to take the gradient enamel and lacquer dials from the tourbillon and minute repeaters, and they're going to transfer them over to the chronographs and the automatics. And in my opinion, that fixes the watch. That's what it should have been from the beginning. Now, they only made 99 of those Bolshoi Theater editions, but that proves they already know what they did wrong and how to fix it. I'll also mention that mechanically, there is nothing to fault here. We've often faulted brands that put premium prices on customer calibers, but the movement for the 1159, well, on both of the mainstream models, the 4401 chronograph and the 4302 automatic, they are entirely credible, good looking, durable, and long legged. The watches feature 70 hour power reserves and the chronograph comes with a flyback standard. This is exactly what you expect from AP. AP had already telegraphed its next move design wise, but I have to say that AP's case design, without any changes, already belonged. A combination of angles, satin finished elements, polished bevels, and curves. It's more complex and more exquisite than it looks in the pictures, and it's nowhere near as thick when you see it in person. The hollowed out lugs and the use of hexagonal bolts inside the retaining bars for the strap suggests that AP properly referenced its best past designs while pushing, in my opinion, into a new field where Hopefully this watch can succeed where the millinery failed, and we'll talk a little bit more about the millinery later on, but I actually think having seen these watches now several times in person, they're a lot better than we thought and a lot better than we gave credit. Were the basic chronograph and automatic dials dull? Yes, they were insipid and they ruined what were otherwise awesome watches that are rife with fun details. I'm given AP 12 months to fix itself, and versions like this, have proved that they are already well on their way. Now this is a watch that frankly a lot of people love, so you may wonder why the Patek Philippe 5711 is on the watches we love to hate list. There's a good reason. The reason is me and you. We have made this a loathsome watch. There is nothing inherently wrong with this piece. It's thin, it's fine, it's highly water resistant, it has real history behind it, it is beautifully made, it comes from a great brand, it will always be attractive, it will never be obsolete, it's made with integrity, and it's been resistant to change, especially in eras when it would have been easy to make it big. Why do we hate this watch? Because for some reason, collectors have decided that this $30,000 watch should cost $70,000. That has nothing to do with anything Patek Philippe has done. It has everything to do with the social media landscape and an ecosystem in which hype is rife and self-propelling. This is a timepiece that frankly, deserves a good reputation in any era, but in our era, it has almost become the Gordon Gecko of watches. And yes, I know Gordon Gecko wore a yellow gold Cartier. All the same, think persona, think character, and that is what we have unfortunately begun to associate with a watch that in every material and immaterial respect is a lovable piece. So 
Patek, I fault you not for this one, but the Nautilus has become a watch we love to hate in an era when the Nautilus has become the most hyped piece on the market. Now jumping into the box, we got Chris N joining from Korea, and we've got NS something saying Rolex was going after the successful used car salesman vacationing in Fort Myers with that two-tone sea dweller. Right here, we've got Adrian Burke saying agreed hype is dull. We got James Blackman saying price is too big right now for the Nautilus. And then we've got Benjamin Burfield saying I love to love the Nautilus, just don't love the prices right now. And Hale Bop agreeing that I just hate the price. Cull Obsidian saying people who obsess over the 5711 as the be-all and end-all of horology need to stop, and I agree with you right there. And then Marco saying, I have the 5711, but I don't wear it as much because of the hype lately. It's almost as though the watch has taken on a stigma because of what other people have built it up into. And then NS something saying, collectors are nothing but hype collectors in that case. And bump, 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 we have Amin Reviews saying the Nautilus has become a watch we associate with non-watch lovers. And that is very true. We have a question from Mark S. Is Brian done on Wednesdays? For now, yes, but we're bringing him back and it'll be very much like what we had before, but it'll be more discussion driven rather than Brian trying to show five watches. We're gonna talk about things that allow us to debate a little bit. I thought the clashes and the interplay in the past were the best part of that show, especially when he could speak his mind, he was steadier and more voluble. And we're gonna bring him back in a format that plays to his strengths and he's got a lot of them, so watch this space. And then right here, we got Larry K saying, I checked out Daytona prices yesterday on Chrono24. They are silly. Just a commodity now craved by millionaires in Asia. Not just millionaires in Asia. And then right here, we got Christopher saying, Hi, Tim from Rhode Island. Thank you for joining me from Rhode Island. We got... Adlin saying, I love the new background. Guys, I heard you loud and clear. The old studio, frankly, sucked. We've brought in something much better, moved the space, redecorated, and it's only going to get better from here. And then we have JV asking, what about Richard Meal watches? Because of volumes, they're not quite at that love to hate level, but we're approaching peak Richard Meal. Watch this space, as I like to say. Now, Chopard, the Alpine Eagle. This was one of the most reviled watches of 2019, and surprise, it's a great watch. I saw it when I was in Dubai, and while it is undeniably derivative of the Royal Oaks and Nautilus of the world, it is actually based on an early 80s Chopard watch called the Saint Moritz. Now that was, in its era, a copy of the Royal Oaks and the Nautilus, so I'm not giving them too many points for originality, but I'm giving them points for the details, because that's where this watch shines. I have to say, the dial is epic. Every version of this dial with the gorgeous metallic swirl, deeper and richer and more harshly grained with a more subtle gradient and more inlaid textures and tones than a typical sunburst dial. This is a very special watch when you get up close under the light. I'll also say that every bracelet link is removable here. The case, the bezel, and the bracelet are hand finished. Every single link is removable, making this bracelet orders of magnitude more thoughtful in its construction than the Patek Philippe Nautilus bracelet, which is now held together by pin sleeves after previously being held together by screws. The movement is a manufacturer caliber, 100 meters water resistant, 60 hour power reserve, and a certified chronometer, which is to say it has all the features and refinements we wish a Nautilus had. And if this watch had cost cost $18,000, $20,000, I would have said forget about it. But at $12,900 new, it's actually a decent price, and it'll be an even better watch to pick up used, because yes, I believe these will sell for under ten dollars pre-owned, making what is already an appealing watch that's fairly priced an even more appealing buy for the folks who don't want to pay the Patek Philippe ransom, or more precisely, the aftermarket ransom. And yes, I'm aware who that includes. I'll also say this, Chopard very subtly included something that they call lucent steel. I'm gonna call it a more harshly tempered steel. It is actually brighter when you see it in person and it's much more scratch resistant based on tentative early reports. All of which is to say there are refinements on this watch that are barely even visible that will pay dividends long term. So guys, let me know in the chat, what are the watches that we love to hate that deserve better? 
And I could see Edward Ledden saying, everyone and their mother made fun of the Alpine Eagle on Instagram. I know quite a few industry folks definitely did. We got Monkey Sea Production joining from Chicago via Santa Monica Beach. I'm very jealous right now. And then we have Scottish Watches joining in saying, greetings, greetings, Scottish. Thank you so much for featuring me on your podcast. By the way, guys, if you haven't seen the Scottish Watches podcast, please Google them, check them out. A lot of fun. Folks who really love watches, they are among us as serious enthusiasts. And then right here we have Peter Campanella saying, the overseas is great. Blue or black dial comes with a leather bracelet or a leather strap, a bracelet, and a rubber strap all in one package. And then we've got a question from Yashar asking, do I think the Explorer will be updated at Baselworld? No. The standard Explorer got its last update in 2016. I think you're going to see an update of the Daytona or the Sub before we see the Explorer or the Explorer 2 redesigned. And I could see NS something saying, all of Chopard, frankly, gets too much hate. And James Blackman commenting on the Alpine Eagle, nice dial. George, uh, George Jace is saying, it actually looks like a Lego watch. That's an interesting interpretation and the first I've heard of that particular comment. And now jumping into our viewer wrist shots, what have we got? What have you got for me? We got Brad A. of New Zealand turning back time with his vintage Rolex Oyster date. We've got Edward B. taking time out while in Dubai. You can see the Burj Khalifa, half a mile tall in the background, featuring his Omega Seamaster Planet Ocean. Andrew handsomely composes a shot of his vintage Patek Philippe Nautilus 3800, very well done. Stephen L. of New York City is in my old love, Miami, with his Oris Aquas date this winter. I still remember those February days riding along the shore on A1A on my Holland Exagrid. I will be back there someday, hopefully sooner rather than later. Guys, reading from the chat, I have Amin Reviews saying, I think the Pepsi GMT Master 2 is becoming a watch or is going to become a watch we associate with non-watch lovers. For that, I don't wear mine as much anymore. That's interesting. And then I could see right here, MBD saying, Jacques Hedro and Breguet don't get enough attention to be hated or loved properly. You might remember my old buddy Claudio. Well, he is now, I believe, the vice president for Jacques Hedro in North America. So I'd like to help my old friend make a difference for that underloved brand. Jacques Hedro, nice watches, low volume, misunderstood. And then right here, I have Emily N asking, anything Tag Heuer seems to be something we love to hate. That's true and it's a little bit unfair, but I think Tag Heuer is a long-suffering brand and the suffering started in the 1980s with the mall department store quartz watches. And I think Tag has had trouble crawling out of that 30-year hole. And then right here we have Entropy. This is a NS something recommendation to Entropy saying, Instead of a Nautilus, a Moser Pioneer Perpetual Calendar with a bracelet. That's a good suggestion. And then I see right here Kevin S. saying, we probably love to hate Tag and Breitling at this point. And I got to kind of agree on both counts. We're going to work on rehabilitating those brands. And then we've got uh, Blake Star saying, I'm a big fan of Breguet myself. It's true. There is no better buy in pre-owned high horology except maybe Chopard, LU's Chopard models. And then we've got Lawrence, Lawrence York joining in from Portland, Oregon, and Adrian Burke commenting, I also think Moser deserves more love from enthusiasts. And then we got Just Horology saying, you know what, at this point I purchased a Chagère Le Coult Polaris, and that is another underloved model line. Good point. And then finally we have comment, Angie, Tim, thoughts on the ceramic root beer. I like it. I think I like it best in full rose gold because that's something Rolex had never done before. The first full rose gold GMT with the Cerachrome root beer dial, I think that's kind of hot. Is it an occasional watch? For me, yes, it would be. But I also think it's a really neat looking piece and probably one of the best root beers ever. Returning to our regularly scheduled program, main feature, the modern classics. Consider the age of some of the model lines that dominate our landscape today. These are the Immortals, the Pantheon. The Patek, well, Patek has its Nautilus, dating to 1976. Audemars Piguet has its Royal Oak, dating to 1972. If you want to find stronger model lines than this, you have to go back even farther. The Rolex Submariner, 1953. The Rolex GMT, late 1954 and the Cosmograph Daytona, originally named Le Mans, 
back in 1963. All of which is to say, while there are hot independents and boutique brands out there that do have wait lists, F.P. Journe, Chronomet Bleu, Philippe Dufour, Simplicity, those kind of watches do square with our understanding of scarcity and demand. Few are available, and these esoteric pieces are products of inherently low volume process. While there are very hot independents out there, I don't consider them part of the pantheon of modern classics. They're too new and untested. But the Rolex models, the Patek, and the Royal Oak, let's remember, these aren't like the Chronomet Bleu, or especially the Simplicity. All of these are mass-produced watches in circulation by the thousands, in some cases even by the millions, and they've been made for decades. While a combination of branding and shrewd production limitation has kept these watches hot, there's another critical element at play here, and that is enduring design. All of the watches I mentioned defy planned obsolescence. They were both good enough from the beginning and sedulously minded by their brand to never change too much. So what are the blue chip classics of tomorrow? If today it's the Nautilus, the Royal Oak, the GMT, the Sub, and the Daytona, what are going to be the Daytonas, the Subs, the GMTs, and the Nautiluses of tomorrow? I'm going to try to guess, and I'm going to try to put together a little bit of a formula. I think they will be like today's classics. Ageless designs that defy obsolescence, they will be mass produced and they will be products of mainstream brands. And while that might not sound exciting at face value, it describes exactly the dominant watches of today's marketplace. So let's set an arbitrary time frame because all of those dominant models come from an era that predates the hegemony of quartz watches and digital devices as time tellers. Let's factor out all the pre-quartz crisis models. And because there are so few enduring classics that emerged in the 1980s, Let's say it's a watch that's newer than 1990, but it's still got to be at least 20 years old as a model line. So pre-millennial, or at the very least, millennial. So to qualify here, a model line's going to have to be at least 20 years old. Starting with my first selection, this is going to be one of the Submariners, one of the GMTs, one of the Royal Oaks of tomorrow, the Omega Seamaster Diver 300 meter. We first saw it back in 1993, when the Seamaster line and Omega as a whole were profoundly crippled brands. The quartz crisis was brutal to Omega. Attempts to compete on a price point basis with East Asian, attempts to compete on a quartz basis with East Asia, both failed. Omega became what TAG was and continues to be a department store watch. So in 1993, it took an all time great design and frankly, shrewd marketing, to pull Omega and the Seamaster line out of the dumpster. And this watch was the key. Yes, we all know about GoldenEye, we all know about Pierce Brosnan, but there's been a lot of product placement over the years. I think Tissot was pr placed prominently in Independence Day 2. Does anyone remember that? No. A watch has to be impressive to impress. And that's exactly what this watch did. Without product placement, this is still a timepiece that was perfectly proportioned, razor thin for a dive watch, wearable as either your formal watch or your sports watch, and for the first time in a long time, Omega's products were qualitatively competitive with Rolex. In fact, this bracelet and the milled out solid steel clasp that came with it forced Rolex to rethink its jingly jangly oyster bracelets and clasps. After this, a stamped clasp would no longer do. That piece of tired tinsel got retired more than anything because of this watch right here. Now let me remind you too that this watch, now 26 years old as a design, is easily the most enduring Omega Seamaster ever. Remember the original CK2913 from 1957? It looks nothing like a Ploprof from 1972. All of which is to say, for the first time ever, Omega had a Seamaster design that could go blow for blow over decades, changing little against the Rolex Submariner. Aesthetically and qualitatively, it's still in the game. And you can buy these used for under $4,000 on a full bracelet, box papers, and still under warranty. You can get these literally for less than half the price of a Submariner. Which is the better watch? It's still the Omega. And I think someday we will speak of this watch in the same hushed and revered tones that we reserve today for the Submariner. It's well on its way. 
Patek Philippe, Aquanaut, 1997. I'll be honest, this one took some time to hit its stride. Way too small when it bowed at 35 millimeters, even a 1,000 piece limited edition on debut wasn't enough to help this baby Nautilus, or Nautilike, compete with its big brother. I will say this though, it is now 23 years since we saw the first Aquanaut. There is an entire family of them, and the expansion of the line has brought richness, credibility, and in my opinion, enduring appeal to the Aquanaut line, especially with the arrival of the Travel Time in 2011, the Dual Time Traveler's Aquatimer, or Aquanaut, pardon me. This became the definitive model, the model that finally stepped out from underneath the shadow of the Nautilus, because at the time, 2011, there was no Travel Time Nautilus, so the Aquanaut for once paved the way. I will also say this, it managed to outlive the cliched strap on everything fad of the 2000s. Remember when we saw straps, rubber straps, specifically on almost every kind of watch imaginable, including dress watches, to questionable effect? Well, the Aquanaut still looks great on a strap. It still looks great on the wrist. And with a whole universe of options, as well as an enduring core design, I believe this is well on its way to standing lug to lug with its older brother as one of the greats. Not just of our era, but of the era to come. This will be part of the Pantheon. And now let me see what you guys are saying in the box. We got Bojan V joining in from Sweden. We've got Chip Wong saying, ask, well, my mistake, I don't know, that's not watch specific. But let me see if I can find the antecedent comment. We got Jean-Claude Biver speaking of the Omega saying the helium valve is the only thing putting me off of a black dial Omega Seamaster Diver 300 meter. Paul Guerra asking about the Rolex Yachtmaster. Stay tuned. And then right here, we have Blake Starr saying, I love how those look. The Aquaterras, that is. And then right here, we got Abdul seconding the comment about the questionable aesthetic value of the helium escape valve. And then right here, we have Jerome Gold saying, I love my Tag Heuer S Link in house movement with a perpetual calendar. That is one of the most interesting Tag Heuer models, I will say that. And then right here, we have Emily N asking, well, agreeing, Longa 1. Maybe Lumen or Zeitwerk. It looks like someone has asked about these watches previously. If you are falling and you have to aim for a box of Longo Ones or Zeitwerks, I say aim for the Zeitwerk. It is an otherworldly watch to live with on a daily basis. And as good as the Longo One is on the backside, the Zeitwerk is that much better. And then right here, we have Big Zebra saying the 90s will return after all in, the tw in 2090. That's true. I hope to be around for it, but I'm not optimistic. And then right here, we have Marco saying my 97 Seamaster wears comfortable, looks great, fends off scratches. I don't know why. It is pretty much a perfect watch. I had that original Bond Seamaster. I had the 2531, and I still have it in my collection. It was my graduation watch. It will always be in my collection. Now, jumping back into our watches that will join the Pantheon, the Vacheron Constantin Overseas. This is a model that came out in 1996. It was at face value, a resurrection of the 1977 222 watch. But here's the thing. The first version of it, while graceful and true to Vacheron's heritage as a dress watch manufacturer, was perhaps a little bit too petite, too fussy in detail, and with a mid-sized ladies model and a quartz option, perhaps not hardcore enough a sports watch to grab the attention of male watch buyers even then. 2000, by the way, they're still great buys and they're lovely watches. They just didn't get traction out of the gate. A chronograph arrived in 1999, and in 2004, the second generation watch arrived with what is now considered to be the signature model of the line, the chronograph. This timepiece made Vacheron a mainstream brand in the 2000s, swelling the volumes, competing for the first time with the likes of Patek Philippe and Audemars Piguet. It was the backbone of Jean Carlos Torres' rise to prominence as a rock star CEO at Vacheron. And it was easily the watch that made the overseas a talking point among watch collectors in the burgeoning online watch community. 2016, however, brings us to the present. 
After 2016 and the third generation watch, we finally had a watch that was not just a Holy Trinity sports watch alternative to Patek and AP, but actually built and detailed like we expect a watch in those exalted ranks to be constructed. So you had the chronograph as ever, but for the first time you had an ultra thin no date option. For the first time you have an automatic self winding that is probably the standout model in the whole line, even outshining the chronograph, which lamentably has lost its double digit date. And I also have to say the combination of dial options, silver, jet black, exquisite brown sunburst, and a lovely lacquer metallic blue that is oh so reminiscent of a certain FP Journe product. This is now exactly the watch you want to buy. Not as a bargain alternative to the Nautilus, but because it's a better product. Quick release lugs, two free straps when you buy the watch, and a bracelet that's fully sizable, display case back, Poinçon de Genève, 150 meters water resistant. You want something different? You've got that no date ultra thin. You've got a world time that shows you 35 time zones. You've got a tourbillon model that's swimmable. This is a timepiece that should offer everything we've ever dreamed of getting in an Haute de Gamme sports watch and does it with no wait lists and no aftermarket markups. It is also an enduring design as it still embodies the best elements of that 1996 original, which is why I think it's going to be one of the immortals of tomorrow when we speak of Royal Oak, Nautilus, and yes, overseas in hushed tones. Jumping into the box right here, I can see a question from Lee V. Rolex Datejust 116234 or 126234. I would say. If you need the three-day power reserve, go with the 126, but I would go with the 116 for pricing reasons. If you wear it every day, the power reserve is a non-factor. Prices are going to be better on the older watch, and if you get a 116264 with the turnograph bezel, then you've got what is my favorite day just all time with silver, black, and white dials available, or I should say silver, black, and blue dials available. The silver is the white dial. You're going to find something very cool that you're going to love. There are also roulette dates, so I would go with a turnograph from the previous generation of the day just. And then Blake Starr saying, I wish the Overseas 3 would have had a grand dot, and I agree with you. The loss of the double digit date, even with the addition of the in-house movement, that was a body blow. And then right here I have Alejo asking, what do I think will happen to the Cellini line? I think ultimately what Rolex, first of all, they will never admit they're wrong and get rid of the Cellini line. But what Rolex really needs to do is just take yellow and rose gold versions of their sports watches put them on straps with deployant clasps, and call it a day. If you've ever seen a modern GMT Master on an alligator leather strap, it is beautiful. It is eye-watering. Daytonas in yellow gold on straps are dress watches. If you've ever seen uh, the 118139 or 118138, the 36 millimeter day dates with blue and green dials in white and yellow gold with matching alligator leather straps and full clasps, that's what a Rolex dress watch should be. Cellini is not necessary unless they want to bring back the King Midas as it was originally launched in 1964. I do feel that Cellini is surplus and I think that a Day Date 840 with the moon phase from the Cellini line would be an absolute knockout and waitlisted till the next century. That's just my opinion on Cellini and the future at Rolex. Now, Bulgari. This is going to be one of the modern classics. This is already a modern hit and Bulgari has become a hit maker. I think this is going to be one of those watches in 2030, 2040, 2050, we look back and cite as one of the all-time greats, and it's exciting because we're living in the origins of this model. Now you might ask, Tim, isn't your rule that a watch must be the year 2000 or earlier, 20 years old? Well, of course, we associate with the Octo Finissimo line, 2014 was the first model. Hang on there, Sean. <laughs> I'm, I'm holding up. 2014 was the first Octo Finissimo, and the automatic came in 2017. But don't forget, the Octo shape was originally penned by a Gerald Genta designer after Genta left that company. And right about when Bulgari bought Gerald Genta in the year 2000, that's the original Octo. And we've already forgotten that it was originally launched as a Gerald Genta in the year 2000 as a platform for retro 
upgrades and jump hours. Bulgari bought Gerilgenta that year along with Daniel Roth there in one building and persisted with the Octo line before achieving mainstream success with the Octo Finissimo manual wind in 2014. And then came the breakthrough, the GPHG men's watch prize winner and the watch that really made Bulgari a, a, a fully credible men's Otagam watchmaker in high horology, the Bulgari Octo Finissimo Automatic in 2017. And that was the moment when I think all of us said there are things going on at Bulgari. The key to the success was Bulgari design chief Fabrizio Buonamassa having comfort working with an existing design rather than insisting on a clean sheet for ego's sake. That happens all the time. If you're wondering why the current IWC Ingenieur looks nothing like the Genta design, that's the reason. And sticking with something that was inherently beautiful and reimagining it for the modern era was a winning move for this brand. Today, it's a tourbillon. It's a minute repeater. It's a GMT chronograph, all ultra thin, unmistakable, all within the same basic shape. I do think this will be a watch family we look upon as some of the greatest ever penned. And I think when we look back on this era, we will look at this line as one of the most exciting, dynamic, and innovative. Not just for its aesthetics, which as we've mentioned are not new, but for everything Bulgari is putting inside the case. The thin profiles, the movements, the water resistant now, 100 meters with 5.25 millimeters of thickness. I can't wait to see where Bulgari takes this shape because it's going places. Finally, you asked, I answer, the Rolex Yachtmaster. It's not part of the golden era. It wasn't released in the 40s, the 50s, or the 60s. It's not kin to the Daytonas and the Submariners and the GMTs and the Air Kings. It's not of that era. It was born of the luxury era. And I should mention, it is Rolex's version of Oldsmobile. Follow me here. Oldsmobile was General Motors' experimental division. When something new and untested needed to be trialed, it wasn't Cadillac, the price leader, or Chevy the volume leader, but Oldsmobile that would be the technology leader with air conditioning, with automatic transmissions, with turbocharging, with front wheel drive, with CRT TV displays inside the car. All of these things, including advanced styling like the so-called tube car, Oldsmobile Aurora of the 90s, Oldsmobile was always where GM tried its most avant-garde style and engineering before taking it over to the more mainstream brands. And that's what the Yachtmaster has been for Rolex, starting with 1992 and this model right here. This model, which featured a full precious metal bezel and the first we saw of the maxi dial, larger indices, this was something that was being trialed in the interest of later adding it to the Submariners. In fact, the Yachtmaster was first supposed to be a luxury redesign of the Sub. Rolex realized it couldn't do that to its longtime tool watch stalwart, so it launched two model lines, a new Sub in 1998, in 1988 I should say, and the Yachtmaster in 1992. This became the above the water yacht top teak deck sports watch for the millionaire sportsman. And it evolved in 1999, hitting its stride as Rolex launched the double platinum, a platinum dial and a platinum bezel. I mentioned to you that after all, the Yacht Master was a trial balloon for future experiments or future innovations, I should say, in the Submariner. And the Kermit of 2003 used the maxi dial, the large indices that were first seen in the 90s on the Yacht Master. The Yacht Master continued to hit its stride in 2012, and I think this is where it really came of age with the 2012 blue dial model. Still a platinum bezel, still a stainless steel case and bracelet, but now so much warmer and more charismatic. This finally feels of our era. 2015, more experimentation. This became the debut platform for the Oyster Flex strap bracelet. We know it's a bracelet because it's metal on the inside, but it's rubber on the outside. This was Rolex trying something very different, and no surprise, it debuted on the Yachtmaster. That same year in the midsize Yachtmaster, Rolex launched a silicon hairspring, which made 
the Yachtmaster line, mid-size and full-size, doubly experimental that year. Finally, Dark Rhodium arrived in 2016, creating what might be the coolest and steeliest looking Rolex I have ever seen. And I have a special warm spot in my heart for this model because I was there at Basel World when this launched, and the people viewing the vitrine were packed four deep. It was that impressive. Now, I should also mention, very recently, the last 12 months, a 42 millimeter case has arrived. And just as Rolex has trialed features that would later come to the Submariner line on the Yachtmaster first, I believe that this might be a test balloon to see how people adapt to a rotating bezel, 42 millimeter, all around wearable Rolex sports watch. In other words, I think this could presage the arrival of a 42 millimeter next generation Submariner. And even if it doesn't, the 226659 is a beautiful piece and easily the coolest Rolex sports watch of 2019. So do I think the Yachtmaster is a future classic? You can bet on it, guys. Let me see your classics right now. We have, uh, I'm jumping straight to wrist shots because we're running a little bit behind schedule, but Addy S shares a familiar face with his Bulova Lunar Pilot reissue while watching some fine YouTube in the background. Surfing the web with me. We have Watch Maniac, a man after my own heart with Ferrari and Alonco Unzona, Datagraph Perpetual Generation 2. Very nice. We have Cameron T of Virginia, lighten up the show with his Ball Master Diver 2, world time, awesome tritium dial watch, nice time lapse exposure by the way. And then we've got Manuel of Buenos Aires, stealing the show with his coruscating Longa Saxonia Thin Copper Blue. I love that backdrop, a combination of color, a medley of tones and textures. Well done guys. Team also with thewatchbox.com. Send me your wrist shots, but also if you want to appear on a collect conversation in the future. Email Monday Mailbag at thewatchbox.com. Right now we're launching our casting call for New York City to Washington DC. We will bring you down here to talk watches, do lunch, and exchange views on the record. Guys, thank you so much. Team also at thewatchbox.com for your purchase and pricing questions about any watches you see on the watchbox or our social media. Thanks to you and thanks to my crew. Time out, Tim out. You guys are the best audience on YouTube and thanks for logging on.